I love that you... <laughs> oh, shit, I really don't remember how to skate. Oh. So what we want to do, though, for sound, is we want to um, we want to be over here and I think just record as people come by that for a bit. Good. Just stabilise ourselves. Okay. Listen. Listen to episode 7 of Excuse the Mess. And if this is your first time listening, it's basically a music podcast created by me, Ben Corrigan. I spend a day with a different composer in each episode. We chat about them and their music, and then we try to make a track of our own in the same day. Episode 7's guest is Mira Kalix. Plucking away in the background is a track of hers called Death Below. And I think this might give you an idea of the sounds of which to expect from our own piece of music later on. So Mira's a really interesting guest. I would say a multi-dimensional artist, someone that not only works with sound but also with visuals, someone that could easily be on stage DJing for like a boiler room video or on stage at the Royal Festival Hall performing with the London Sinfonietta. So she works with really boundary-pushing contemporary classical ensembles. She's also signed to Warp Records, which a lot of people see, and I do myself, as one of the most innovative record labels around and have been for quite a number of years. We're going to hear a little bit about her background, and we're obviously going to talk about lots of her pieces and her approach and the things that are interesting her at the moment. She has an academic interest in social media and you're going to hear how she implements social media throughout some of her works. And it's always interesting to hear from someone who's studied that a lot closer than most people do. We also talk about her latest work, Ode to the Future, which is a piece that takes data from six babies in utero and then sonifies it through various different techniques. Like a lot of the work she's been doing over the last 10 years, this has a visual aspect to it too. So tricky situation to be in making a podcast which is purely audio based but I'm going to put lots of links into the podcast description so you can further investigate what her music looks like and sounds like now I spoke to Mira well ahead of actually doing the episode we needed to basically come up with a way of creating some sound she doesn't play an instrument so we needed to find a location where we could gather some sounds to use and she instantly replied saying ice rink And we're going to start this podcast with her explaining why the strong desire to go to an ice rink. But before we do that, I'm going to clumsily insert my thank yous. So thank you to Arts Council England, PRS Foundation and the Notice Fellowship. And thank you to you for downloading this podcast. And please do, if you think you have a friend that might really enjoy the podcast, then send it their way. I hope you enjoy listening. This is Mira Kalix, Episode 7. Yeah, so uh, I contacted you and said, let's go find a space... Straight away, ice rink. So yeah, I said ice rink because I think quite possibly I just did a thing for Here and Now on Radio 3 where they've been asking composers to talk about their favourite sounds and one of mine is bowling balls. I did a piece for string quartet and bowling balls but another one is ice. I love the sound of ice. But I did a, a piece working with Tansy Davies which very much relates to how I um, started learning to notate and everything myself but um, we uh, we were out in France in the snow and we found these huge, like, uh, massive icicles, massive, massive I- icicles. So we, we were recording them out in the woods, but then also bringing them in and putting them in metal buckets and then, you know, um, crushing them, smashing them and all that kind of stuff. But the sound of ice is very distinctive. So we did get a, um, we called him our percussionist like yeah. a beautiful young boy I went and cheekily <laughs> asked if somebody could come do some hard stops for us now hard stops is basically a way of um, when you come in at high velocity it's exactly what it sounds like and you basically do like a T stop with your skates so you bring them in a T and then you get just that lovely <laughs> amazing thank you that might be the entire piece at this rate <laughs> um, but yeah I love the sound of of ice, uh, 
even like if you take ice cubes out of the, um, I don't know if you've got any in the freezer. I do I don't actually, know. Yeah. So if we bought ice cubes out and we pour water over the ice cubes, that would sound amazing. We just hear all the cracks. Mm. And then the thing about ice is obviously, yeah, we're solidifying. We, we're taking something, you know, fluid and making it solid. Not very deep. I know I'm saying something obvious. On the album on I Set Against the Sun, I record Snow Melting. It's the track where I'm singing whenever it rains, but actually that was snow melting. So I left a recorder out for about a day just recording snow melt. Wow. So yeah, I've, uh, yeah the, these are things that have sort of cropped up throughout. So it's, and what's interesting there is obviously it does just sound like water, which is what it is. You know, and what you're hearing is basically that, that change in, in materiality. And here you go, this is the track with the snow melting. It's called Because To Why. Now we're going to jump back in time to just after the ice rink recording session. We had a nice leisurely walk and a chat enjoying the sun, but unfortunately a bit of wind too, so apologies to any audio files out there. It's a little bit blowy. It's good. I think that's all right. Yep, one, two, one, two, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. It's going to be a bit windy. Is that all right? I mean, that's it's natural. It is Yeah. It's podcasting, isn't it? You're a podcast fan though, aren't you? Yeah, to a point. My favourite podcast is the um, New Yorker non-fiction. Okay, I have um, listened to that. I love it. So what they do is um, a writer picks a short story from the archive, they talk about it, he or she reads it, and then they talk about it some more. But what I'm a big fan of radio, which is why I think I've gone to podcasts. So sure. I like it because I can multitask. Yeah, so in that's fact, it. my yeah. stories this week is all radio. Oh, I was going to talk to you about mm. that. I just, you've definitely been enjoying the sunshine, mm. haven't you? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, you've got, what is it, a little portable... Is solar it a, radio. Is it solar radio, mm. exactly. So have you been hanging out in the fields Garden. near your... Yeah, yeah. I saw those yesterday or the day before. They made me chuckle. Yeah, there's some yeah. more instalments. <laughs> yeah. You're really on it with the Instagram and the social media. And Not I think Facebook. That's... I've always hated Facebook, yeah. so... Seems really impersonal. And I no one really just seems hate to give the a shit. commodification of friends. Yeah. I think I had like a conceptual problem with that from the start. Mm -hmm. I love Twitter. You can follow and unfollow people. It's no offence. Instagram somewhere between the two. Yeah, but I think you've got a positive relationship with social media compared to uh, a lot of people I talk to. So I've been doing a social media anthropology course at UCL oh, and. Right. Um, a Twitter analytics course. It's part of my practice. So I think social media is like the invention of the wheel or the bridge or the train. As in, I think anything that changes our perception of time and, and place is a huge change in society. And social media is that. It fucks with time and... Can I swear on this? Please do, so, yeah. So it fucks with time <laughs> and space. And so... I'm living through the invention of the wheel and therefore mm. I cannot do anything other than use it in my work because it's the most exciting thing to happen in my lifetime in, this, in that sense of disrupting time and place. Now, I work in a time-based medium, so anything to do with time is riveting for me. Mm. And so I think it has its pluses and its minuses because my perspective is... It is us, but it's the wild west because we're making the rules as we go. And so Instagram's a great example. It, you'll notice that the new features almost weekly. And it's a big dialogue between us and the UI, you know, the user interface designers. So they add things which we either accept or reject. 
and therefore it's like it's an invent you know it's a constant invention and you're watching it happen around you and I'm you feel yeah. obliged to interact with it in some way I feel through your art yeah, well it's all one thing yeah. <laughs> art is life <laughs> and um, and so it has become part of an ongoing project so I'm constantly using elements of social media under this bigger banner this uh, by being two places and once which included and includes the live streams we portals this idea of performance for an audience of one so mm. for the fifth screens <laughs> yeah it's about perf doing performance art or exhibiting work in the other place yeah so i i break them up as cuz i don't think we have the lexicon so i break it up as living in the physical and non-physical landscape. So some people say IRL, or some yeah. people say online, yeah. uh -huh. or the internet. I don't think they quite cover what it is. We are yeah. existing in two places at once, which obviously yeah. is, it's a bit bonkers, is Einstein isn't it? and all those things, but we are. Yeah. So you I, and I are walking now, but we're also existing in another place where things are happening. Exactly. I think that might be what a lot of people's frustrations are with it at the same time, which is what, so you look at it as like this interesting time for humanity. Yeah. And uh, it's a very interesting social thing. But social, but also, like I said, because of its disruption to time and space. Mm. Like, you pick up your phone and all sense of time changes yeah it really does it really does i was yeah? scrolling down facebook today thinking what am i doing i've done exactly. this for five minutes yeah so that's the key of why i'm interested in it because mm. way so your body might be in one place but you are not there yeah so my i document people in art galleries who've left the building so people who just stop quite often in, fr in front of a piece of art but they're they're looking at their phone but what they are is somewhere else Earlier on, Mira mentioned one of her favourite sounds was bowling balls, and this is a track from her album, Elephant in the Room, called Bowling for Strings. Anthropology side is really interesting. Mm. Um, that's maybe the most interesting. And how are you incorporating that into your works? Uh, in various ways. Sometimes works are made completely for the physical, I mean, for the non physical landscape. Um, sometimes they're exhibited here. I don't know, it's just an ongoing preoccupation mm. under this big umbrella. Yeah. Of, of Do you want to keep away from the road for a bit longer? Yeah. It's quite nice, isn't it? Um, so each work has its own title, but they all fall under the umbrella. And so are you cooking up other pieces at the yeah. moment? Yeah, they're always Can you talk pieces. about what's cooking up in, under that umbrella? So if I'm photographing the people who've left the physical landscape, but their bodies are here, mm. when they return, they, they quite often physically pull back. It's quite interesting. interesting. 
Um, and we also know that stoop. So even in silhouette, we know this like bending of the neck. Uh -huh, and yeah. we know that, uh, you know, we know, even though people are listening to us now, they know, if they know what I'm talking about, they know that curved hand, they know the curved neck. Um, quite often I've noticed very young people tend to fold themselves right over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then this kind of drastic pulling back. So I'm working with choreographers on a proposition of if this is how we transport ourselves from the physical landscape into the non-physical landscape, what are, the, what are the body's movements when moving from the non-physical landscape to the physical landscape? Interesting. So if we were yeah. there, how do we come back here? So here we lurch back. Yeah. And I'm saying to them, what do we do over there? So, uh, so that's the series and so, been asking choreographers to create an action or a pose, um, which I then will remake all of them. In video will, form? Yeah. 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 Um, and so that will become another series of work. DM me, which is watching a sort of... A wild up there, I should go through here. Yeah, the, the purpose behind that, which is a piece just performed by the Hermes experiment, we should say, so that's yes. creating a graphic score from a DM conversation, and it's two people who meet, obviously I'm one of them, yeah. <laughs> um, who meet uh, in the real world very briefly for about 10 minutes, mm. and then form a friendship, which has happened a lot to me, by staying in contact. And what was interesting to me there is how our language and rhythm and patterns change. So as we get to know each other, we start adapting each other's idiosyncrasies and habits uh, even in the non-physical landscape, you learn people's mannerisms. So they're people who I'm now very good friends with and I can tell what kind of day they're having just by how they're tweeting. Um, I can tell just by the use of language and the amount. Yes. But they're people who I literally only know them as a picture. And if I say Bill from Washington, who's a good friend, I just see their picture in my head, the little round thing, yeah, but, yeah. but actually I have really quite close relationships with these people in a particular way. We're part of each other's daily rhythm. We see each other all the time. I don't believe you can, even when it's a Kim Kardashian type character, I don't, I don't think you can keep a construct on social media for very long. I think, I think the real you shines through. I thought so. Both. Here's a little snippet of DM me being performed live by the Hermes experiment at Cafe Otto. One thing that I've sort of observed of what you have done through the years is um, it's become a, a lot more visual and, and I kind of think of you as not necessarily just a musician, you're an artist that the, the, the visual side of things is always really stunning. Like, oh, it's, it's not you. like there's a compromise, like there's, no, a, there's a musician really important having to me. a go at the yeah. visuals. You sort of create I, this whole, which is just I think amazing. it's about environment. So I'm going to jump in because I couldn't figure out, it's really early two years ago, I was having this conversation with the curator and you know, so often people like ask what you do and it becomes like a very long-winded answer. Although now I always just say I'm an artist and I say I use sound. It's like a standard shtick, you know, you just yeah, get sound is my primary material, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And it was a random conversation at a party in a kitchen, you know, one of those. Yeah. And what I realized is that I'm an environment builder. What I like mm -hmm. to do is build environments. So I love to work with diffusion or surround sound. I love to place, whether it's musicians or speakers, I, I like to build environments. Even yeah. if it's in a straight concert hall setting, I'm often moving people into the wrong place. Or mm -hmm. So I like us to be in something and I want to build 
spaces and so part of that how things look and feel and where you are in them maybe also because I make fucking weird music so actually that all helps yeah. tell that narrative and narrative is part of environment building and I, 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 am, an, I am interested in like abstracted narrative or non-linear narratives yes. I'm yeah. always telling stories even if, I mean, with DM Me, it's very clear and I'm telling everyone the story, but quite often I'm not sharing the story, but, mm. but there is one for me. I'm not conceptual in, in, or abstract in that sense. I'm always, there's always a story for me. Can we talk about um, Ode to the Future? Yeah. Um, this is probably your most recent thing that's out there, and it's, well, you'll be better to explain <laughs> it really than me. Not... It's really crazy project. Yeah, it's a crazy project. Um, so... Originally, this is working with a life sciences company. I mean, as in, like, they do research. And there's just no way on earth I could have done this without their involvement because what I landed up having access to is six uh, fetuses in utero. I'll say that again because of yeah, the truck. Yeah, so six fetuses in utero. These little things uh, which are sitting <laughs> in their mother's stomachs between the ages of 16 and 32 weeks. So I had them in different um, points of gestation. And so what I did was working with GE, the people who make ultrasound, because what I was really interested in, and this probably summarizes my work. Um, so when we say ultrasound, I don't think people really, people say they go for a sonogram. I mean, it's all in the name, but I don't think people really realize that what when they see their little baby or their kidney or whatever it is, but yeah. mostly we, we're used to this for baby scans, is sound is being used to show you a picture. I mean, it's really simple and it's obvious to you and me, but I don't think people really think about that. They just say those words. The picture, the reason you see your soon-to-be baby is because of sound. And so the idea was to use the ultrasound process, sound to picture, picture to data, and then it was basically data to sound and sound back to picture. And so what we did was um, scan these babies. So I have a roughly 20 minute scan of each child and then using, kind of using grayscale, using the size of the baby and its movement, quite simple, but basically uh, sonifying that data. And this is one of the ways in which that data has been sonified. This is sort of its most electronic form. software, taking these grayscale videos and then basically, again, time and pitch, giving a set of rules to the baby in the womb. So it's a baby in the womb at that moment in time, that particular video that we had. Um, and then what you landed up was with, mus well, lines of music effectively, but the big thing that becomes clear is music is repetition of melodies. Data does not repeat necessarily very much. And I made two pieces, um, one which is called 16 Weeks, which is actually a load of lines from different sort of angles of the baby who was 16 weeks, whose mum I know, which is quite nice. Yeah. And, um, and that's very close, if you listen to it, it's like a 15 minute piece and it's, ver it's very close to the data. Uh, but it's as close as could be played, so it's, I, it's tidied up, with some, quite a lot of creative nudging, otherwise it literally would become unlistenable, only in the sense that it's actually four lines which I distribute amongst six instruments, uh, otherwise it would just become a cacophony. Mm. So the second piece, the Ode to the Future, which was the thing I was meant to do from the start, is an abstracted version. I took tiny little melodies from all the babies. I wrote a piece of music about the whole experience. I mean, and it's much more 
my view of something and yeah. it's not so literal. So you can, if you listen to 16 Weeks first, yeah. and then listen to the other one, you can recognize elements, but obviously there are another five babies in the second one and it's yeah. not data. It's like, no. it's me taking data and then writing a piece of music. Yeah, so it's your overall yeah. feelings towards it, which, like listening to it, I think I sent you a message when you first released yeah. it. Yeah. said, like, Wow, like just such a beautiful <laughs> It's the and most uplifting. optimistic thing I've ever written. <laughs> it really is. I mean, yeah. it's insane. This is Ode to the Future. was that first moment of scanning the first mum. I think there was a sudden realisation, you know, it'd been months of preparation. But for, you know, there was this privilege of this mum, you know, because obviously it's the mum I'm dealing with and the wonderful sonographer who played a huge part in it. You know, and we were looking at the, what for them was something really personal and precious and I'd been given free reign, you know, and I think, so there was some emotion in that. It's quite, it's quite special. It's very personal. Uh, one of the babies being born so far. The others Lovely. are all still coming. It's a funny legacy that it's they're going to have legacy. behind them already. So that was interesting. And then the last part of it is obviously I went sound to picture, picture to data, data to sound, and then back to picture. So it was how to take this piece of music and then re-visualize it. But I'm a real analog person. Yeah. And so, thinking about the science connection, I thought about ripple tanks. I don't know if people listening to this will remember, but that's the first time I saw sound uh, as a kid in the classroom, and they still do it. That hasn't changed. As in, they get what looks a bit like an overhead projector, it's water, and they project down, and they bang things, and you see waves. You, you see sound. And so I made a very big and expensive version of that, which then two people, uh, Charmian and Daniel Poirot, the violinists, I mean, they're, they're musicians. They had to be musicians. Then replay in this Perspex and Glass tank, the piece of music. Yeah. So in the video, we're talking about you'll see a clip of it, but I will release a full version. And it looks absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and it's stunning. the simplest thing in the world. Yeah. So it's kind of taking the classroom thing and then making it like three meters. Yeah. But again, it's interpretive. The musicians are actually interpreting it under my direction. So it's not an algorithm. It's two people actually playing what they hear. And that's what interested me. Like it's, yeah. again, it's, I think through all of this, I'm using all these scientific things, then it's very human, like yeah. superhuman. So I use, like if we had to make a broad, which you're not asking me to, but this is a common theme. I use a lot of technology, but um, I'm not interested particularly in showing it. I use it because it's the right pencil to use. And so it quite often isn't at the forefront of what I'm doing. 
but it's what makes the thing work. I'm thinking uh, of another We've great example. We've stopped going up the hill, thank God, everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've got a small incline coming Gosh. up. <laughs> We're going to go straight for food, though. You up for okay. that? Okay, yep. Hungry? Yes. Uh, Nunu, am I saying that right? Yeah, Is that Nunu. how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, well so That's a Perfect. good example of this exact thing you're talking about, where you've used a lot of technology to make something yeah. really human or, or natural. Super organic, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a video on Vimeo where there's super close-up shots with the music behind of all these bugs in jars and this yeah. kind of thing. And it's amazing watching them with this music because like music does, it sort of gives you a, a different perspective of what you're looking at. And it made me think, oh, I've never seen insects like this before. And also the live performance, which was, was it with the Aurora? No, no. Uh, it's London Symphonietta. Symphonietta, yeah. yeah. So you performed live electronics yeah. with them. Live so, electronics, but actually the electronics were all recorded, so it's actually all audio-based yeah. um, recordings of insects, but um, in anechoic chambers. So lots of things very close up, like a moth's uh, uh, wings or uh, like a caterpillar coming out of a pooper or, uh, or ants walking. So things that we don't normally get to hear because they're too small a sound. Yeah. And through this process, I, <laughs> like most people, if I hear a wasp, I move, you know? Uh, yeah. but, I, uh, but I had the wasps, and I just slowed them down, and they sounded like a string quartet. Oh, nice. So that main motif that you hear all the time mm. is the wasp. So, da, 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 da. It's in B, weirdly. Um, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But, and so then the idea, again, very simple, was... If the insects sound like musical instruments, let's make the musical instruments sound like insects. Yeah. And so it's very simple premise. It is a score with various modules. Um, so they have all these motifs which work around the wasps, but then how we cycle through them is, again, we work in rehearsal, so every time it's done is different because they're different insects every time they're on stage in a fish tank normally, um, with microphones. And um, uh, so yeah, so the players sort of bring out their most uh, insecty aspect of what they can do.
Just before we reached our lunch destination, Mira explains a little bit about her background. Really, my training is in visual art. Okay. Um, so that explains that all of it. That does explain a lot. Full circle. Yeah. I never studied music. I studied ballet very seriously. Oh, right. Which explains why I love to work with dancers. Yeah. I used to go to ballet uh, after school every day, so it was quite serious. Um, ballet dancer and there was no time to learn the piano which I was desperate to learn and then had a choice to like go and be a ballerina and decided I didn't want to be a ballerina but I never learned to play an instrument my father comes from a very very musical family my mum is literally tone deaf so I think that explains my weird sense of rhythm and mm -hmm. tone yeah, yeah. because when people tell you there's no such thing as tone deaf my mum's party trick is to sing happy birthday on birthdays because you've never heard anything sound so insane. <laughs> and she can't hear anything but rhythm. Anyway, so, but what I did learn was obviously, I learned discipline, you know, and I learned, because ballet gave me all those things and it also gave me a world and a great love for classical music. Uh -huh, so yeah. Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky and like all those big, you know, yeah. not, not the weird shit, like the, the canon in a way. Mm -hmm. And my best friend's mum worked at the opera house, so I went to the opera. <laughs> I was quite a cultured child. Um, and, Very much so. and so I was exposed to all these things, so we had free tickets, you know, so we'd just go, like, and we'd go see anything, because, yeah. you know. Um, but I couldn't play anything, and I think if I hadn't have sort of come through the computer age, you know, I think I went for three guitar lessons and gave up because it just seemed really boring um, <laughs> as an adult. But they were transferable skills. Art is art, is what I'm saying, and the things that I did. So I studied visual art and I did dance. And then, um, and it's all about communicating things, but not using words. So not coming from the writer's ilk, yes. which I admire. Like, I'm such a fan of words and I'm so rubbish at them. So I was crazy about music. Mm. I thought musicians were really special because they'd learned to do the thing. I just saw these blobs on the page and then what the fuck they were. But it was more that they could play things. And um, so really by borrowing a sampler and then eventually getting bits of equipment and walking around a bit like with what we're doing, yeah. but it used to be a tape machine, yeah. um, and just started making a noise, you know, um, and, and read manuals and just, don't know, didn't really know the rules. I mean, that's the thing about being self-taught. You don't know the rules. You just yeah. do things. I think there's a sense of that comes through your music, where at whatever yeah. period you're listening to it there's uh, an exploration which is yeah it's totally it's definitely experimental like, like not not in the sense that you don't <laughs> know the rules it's just that there's but i'm not yeah i'm not following like i must go from minor to major whatever or i must yeah. do a key change because to be honest when i, I started i don't know i mean i knew by ear uh, but i didn't know what things were called um at all yeah so i had a great love i was a big music person but i didn't and I was DJing and doing all these things, so yeah. And another amazing aspect of yeah. like how diverse your <laughs> skill set Practices. is. Yeah. I'm Boiler hard room to quantify, to, yeah. to the South Bank Centre yeah, or it whatever make it is. Any yeah. sense. But it's um, but it does, because I only ever do things I find challenging and interesting. It sounds like a cliche, but if something gives me the fear, I say yes to it and then if I know how I'm gonna do it I say no. So them's the rules. Because yeah. if I know how to do something then I've done it and then there's no point. If when something comes to me and, and I can figure out immediately how to do I've, it. I've noticed that albums for you have stopped mm. and you're doing, not that like the work you're doing now is any less involved, no, like one piece fact, is probably like three albums yeah, yeah. worth of work. Yeah. 2008 was Elephant in the yeah. Room. And um, but yeah, now you've had 10 years of these big scale yeah. pieces. And environments, like and a lot of the time yeah. you have to be in the work, so it's installation. So they are like albums, but you have to, the only way to experience them is to be there. I, I've sort of lost my love of stereo, which an album is. On a personal level, I started getting interested in installations and this idea of like living in an album or being in an album. So the big stone sculpture I made for the Olympics, yes. that's a song. So yeah. I, when you see me talk about it, I say, that's a song, but the only way to experience a song is to be with it. Yeah. But it's a song, it's one song, but it only exists in that format. Yeah. There's no other format for it. Yeah. Uh, so I quite often started looking at things like that. So it would be, it would be, I'd think of things as a song or as an album, but, but you had to physically 
be in the work. It's going to be difficult dropping in bits of your music yeah, into a podcast. Yeah, because they're going to sound it's so different. Exactly. So, I mean, I hope people will follow whatever links I put into the description yeah. to lots and lots of these videos, which, again, won't actually give you a decent sense of what it is. I know. Um, <laughs> But, but I think it but, always sounds like me. I think. Oh yeah. I yeah. think what's quite interesting because there's also a big difference between like stuff that's purely electronic, stuff that's electronic with classical instruments, and then now there's stuff that's just purely like the things yeah. we were talking about. There are no electronics. Yeah. But I think you can always, um, or I hope you can always hear me. But I think yeah, you can. There's some, especially I think rhythm. The thing that my mum always spots when I play her anything or the fact that when I walk in the rehearsal room everyone's trying to find the one I have a very strange sense of rhythm uh -huh. yeah. which I think sounds exactly like that uh, so my <laughs> own joke to myself is I write rhythms that sound like something fell down the stairs yeah. I think that's probably the thing yeah. where you can tell it's me I really love this crunchy track called Sparrow from Mira's album One on One. They sound like field recordings that mm. they're manipulated. Like, uh, what we're going to do today, example. yeah. Um, I'm like, those sounds are heavy and deep mm. and dark, and what the hell are they? It's like, maybe it, this purpose is like traditionally like that sort of a kick drum put in a weird place. Yeah. That sort of functions like a snare, but like that sound is not a snare. And that's a yeah. Snare. And, and, and that's the sort of music that I'm really drawn to as well. Yeah, um, yeah I'm massively into like your, your percussion yeah. production, I love it. And Thank as you, you say, today is going to be really fun. Trying yeah, because like we're going to have these... to make something super quick and it will yeah. probably just be percussive. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's the percussion that drives it. And that maybe, um, I'm doing a bit of self-analysis, which I hadn't thought of, but you know, maybe that, because um, often when you do interviews, that's the thing you realize things, so you start exactly. having to quantify. Okay. But that's the thing that relates to dance or movement. I yeah. So even when people would listen to my music and go, what? I'm dancing in the studio. I'm always yeah. moving to everything I do. Like, um, So when I'm writing, I'm, I'm also moving around the studio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is an inherent rhythmic There's drive. There's always an inherent yeah. rhythmic drive. I think more, and that's maybe the connection, like if you went to listen to my first album and you listen to this Ode to the Future thing and obviously there's a huge, you know, I've learned so much, so much has changed mm. like in 15 years, you know, it's very different but actually the person who still has to keep bouncing around, she says bouncing around, is yeah. in, you know, that yeah. thing. fade into a different track now from a different album from Skim's Gitter from 2003. This is I May Be Over There, open brackets, but my heart is over here. 
I find this really interesting because it's just this very beautiful tonal piano thing with a backdrop of unsettling sounds. It's just a good example of Mira's ability to give you something familiar yet peculiar at the same time. started working because I got very lucky I got breaks so Opera North and Aubra Music gave me chances to write for classical instrumentation and Kronos Quartet have a role to play in this as well um, gave me the opportunity to start working with classical instruments which I was desperate to do uh -huh, yeah. but didn't didn't have that knowledge or whatever and and I, but I think that's where a little love affair happened between me and, and what happened or what is called contemporary classical I was made quite welcome I think because what I was doing was quite experimental and in a way totally connected to what they were doing um, so there was an affinity and an admiration and and those people could do what I was it's do. quite interesting that you were able to, uh, I'm going to say, infiltrate, not like you're an imposter, but like but slightly, infiltrate yeah. because you'd establish yourself as an electronic artist. Absolutely, like, yeah. And, and looking from the outside, that's probably what people would assume is what you do. Yeah. And, you know, now, uh, very recently, you had a, a London Symphony Etta Commission for the uh, Gursky. Yes. And, and, and I mean, yeah. uh, and, and over, you know, Loads quite a long those, time yeah. now, there's been tons and tons of stuff. Yeah. I was given a lot of help in that. I was, you know, I never bullshitted about my skill set. So, you know, I always ask for longer rehearsal times because I could always um, talk to players. Uh, but just so everyone knows, now I notate all my scores myself. I write everything in, in Dorico or Sibelius. But at first, what I used to do was play everything by ear. So I'd make, I'd write the music completely um, using Cubase. That's my software of choice. And then um, it would then be transcribed into notation uh, by someone I worked with all the time. And then we'd go back and put in the dynamics and all that stuff. So they would take the zeros and ones, the MIDI, make it playable because that's not playable. Mm -hmm. So I was always writing, but obviously what happened was I was handing scores and I knew what everything should sound like very clearly but I can read the score. I yeah. mean, now I, I'm in control of the whole thing. Yeah. But that happened quite slowly and again through yeah. another lucky yeah. break. But so I'm self-taught in notation and orchestration. But the skills are now fully mm. acquired for Yeah, that. which yeah. is great, so I have that control. Yeah. It's time to do the music bit of the podcast. So we're going to revisit the ice rink and use all the sounds we collected there and only those sounds to make a track. I think Mira would agree with me that the disclaimer built into the name of the podcast, Excuse the Mess, could be applied to this track. We did it super quickly and we only had about an hour and a half to two hours to make the music before uh, Mira had to head off to the next thing in her busy schedule. So to walk you through how we made the track, I'm going to use a combination of discussions that happened after and the conversations that were happening in real time whilst we were actually making the track sat by the computer. The track is based around lots of percussive loops, and uh, if I'm honest, they probably do get a bit annoying if you hear too much of them. So I'm going to move through everything very quickly, so by the time it actually gets to hearing the finished full track, you're not already sick to death of those sounds. What was I asking you before? I was asking you if that's a similar process oh, to how yeah. you would normally work. So my observations were... Um, oh, wow. Well, my observations. At first, like this kind of chaotic snipping and moving and mm. sliding things around. A lot of it was visual. Find, yes. If you notice that, it was like looking at the waveforms going, want that, want that, yeah. want that, boom, boom, boom. And it's a c creating a little sound bank. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's the boots. Yeah. Go and grab all the stuff from the boots. That's doing a skating lap. Because we didn't have a lot of time, we didn't like sit and listen to 30 minutes and then carefully choose. It was much more... I mean, this is a collage way of working, mm. obviously. So... Yeah, it, and it was very much just looking at the waveforms and going, that looks like a good bit. Oh, it is a good bit. And then looking for uh -huh. a few things yeah, that, yeah. like the boy doing the hard stop, yeah. we were looking for that because we knew it sounded exactly. great. So yeah. we basically isolated 
and we coloured them, which is that I do all the time. Always important. So we coloured them. So we had pink for for certain kind of percussion, which was the, st the hard stops. <sighs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, nice. this is so it already sounds like the Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> the greens and the yellows were anything ambient. Mm. Mm. Nice. Ooh. And the blues were our little booties, which was all percussion. And then we just made a two-bar loop. If I put down like a little rhythm, mm, bit, yeah. then it will sound Calixian without trying. Yeah. Yeah. That's something. Yeah. Oh, save it. Um, but uh, we played in the oh, mutes yes. in real time. Yeah. That's, I wouldn't normally do that. We did that because it was a time saver. Yeah. And also it was super instinctive, so that was great, so... Yeah, that really worked. Then it was just adding more sounds to develop this loop. Don't really like it. Could it... I think we should keep it as an accent. Mm -hmm. We'll find some way for it. I've just remembered the other part of our boots that... Oh, too big. Oh. Which aren't in there at the moment. Oh, that's so nice. Is that it, yeah. the Velcro? Oh. Yeah, that's it, yeah. But mm. we shouldn't introduce them all at once. And then I think we can start looking for for some pitchy, atmosphery stuff. Yeah. But yeah, if that all came in at once, it'd do your head in. We need something vaguely... <laughs> something uh, non softer. Yeah. yeah. We need some what? kind of... Mm, Is it uh, EQ, like a filter, filter freaky... Like a filter yeah. something, something... Yeah. So... Yep, that's yeah. cool. So then with automation, we can just sweep that in and out. But that's nice. quite nice, because it would just add some fluid, you know, because otherwise it's just going to be like, everything's going to sound identical. Yeah. Mute like a early one or something, yeah. you know. So, so we actually, we don't want to have them all in. We just want to keep flipping the order. Just so it's constantly shifting. Just ran very simple effects. I mean, hardly anything. Well, yeah, we didn't do actually that much manipulation at all. Mm -mm. There was the background ambient sounds that we added. That sort of texture. Yeah, pitched. A bit. For for uh, formant shifting yeah. sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, that was the trick, was to go and use a vocal effect on what was really a texture. That's nicer, I think. It's just more even. Just... Try to take all the bass out of it. Because then we can hear more icy. Yeah. How much? Mm, that's it, that's nice. Oh, that's Ooh, nice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Nice moment. Maybe we should use. Mm, that's that. nicer. And that could also be. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Um, nice. Maybe we have like a midpoint mm. where something like that happens. Just bring this so that there's, they overlap each other. Mm -hmm. And then on this one, the spot, the row below, just go to whatever the standard shit is for, vo for voice. Mm -hmm. Like for like an octavo. Oh, that's quite nice. Go to the next one. Mm. Yeah. So now, no, not the resonant. The low one. Oh, no, not spunky. <laughs> Great name. Low format is quite nice. Yeah. So, nice. so you'll hear it the first time, so mm -hmm. if you skip back. So this will just right. keep morphing, they so like we'll just that. run it. So we'll run the same thing throughout the track, but let's find another one that sounds good cool. coming out of low format. Yeah, it sometimes goes. using vocal things on non-vocal things is really nice. Here are some of those sounds just in isolation.
I just heard something sort of coming from that Come, next one it. along. Oh, well, well, yeah, you want to chip, chop, chip, that you want to meet little, some bits of it. Little mini, mini yeah, fade-ins yeah. of that. Ooh, yeah, yeah, good it. Oh, nice. Yeah, make them even shorter. Yeah. Next, we discovered some bass and a weird scream. I like that. Yeah. The problem is, I don't know how it's going to fit in our overall. Also, I wonder if we cannot take whatever that bass line is. Yeah. If we just let it roll on. We could even, um, with the EQ actually, just start raising the bass yeah. as, as the track progresses. And we're nearing the end now. Mira went in and scattered around some more random percussive accents and moments just to sort of decorate the track. A few more random bits and then we're done. Yeah. Like we just need to populate it with some of them. Nice. Yeah, nice. Shit style ending. <laughs> okay. Oh, I've done it. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it through. But yeah. Love the outro. Yeah, I like the end. So, cool. hey. We made it. <laughs> what do you think? I think it's pretty good Print. for an, an hour and a half's worth of, yeah. two hours worth of. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, it's amazing to see your process, actually. Really? Is it your normal process? Well, it can't be your normal process, but there's it definitely is, but elements of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, here it is, the finished ice rink music.
Well, that's it. Episode 7 with Mira Kalix, all done. Massive thanks to her for being part of the podcast and suggesting we go to an ice rink, which I thought was a great idea. Hugely appreciate her giving up a day to be part of the podcast. And uh, also want to say thanks to Emily Hall, who put us in touch in the first place. You can check out more of Mira's music at her portal. So if you Google Mira Kalix portal, you'll certainly find it. You can also go to her website. Uh, that's mirakalix.com. You can find loads of videos and music and links to lots of her different projects on there. She's also, as you may have worked out, an avid Twitter user. You can follow her at at Mira Kalix. Also, her Instagram feed is pretty fun, at Mira Kalix with an underscore afterwards. Thank you all for listening into this episode. I hope that you enjoyed it and you want to listen to more. You can subscribe on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you use. Uh, all the likes and shares and ratings and all that stuff are all really helpful. So please do keep spreading the word. You can keep up with more Excuse the Mess stuff on Instagram, which is ETM Podcast, Twitter at ETM Pod and Facebook. And there's the ETM website, etmpodcast.com. We're nearing the end of Series 1. One more episode to come, so there'll be updates on that soon. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. As a little thank you, the wonderful people at Red Dog Music are continuing their support with a discount coupon that you can use online if you type in Excuse the Mess, all one word, all lowercase, at the checkout. Then you can have yourselves some money off whatever it is you're buying there. So, yeah, hope life's good. Hope you're all well. Thank you again for checking out Excuse the Mess. This final bit of music is a Mira Kalix and Oliver Coates rework of a Boards of Canada track called A Beautiful Place in the Country and it was featured on a Warp Records 20th anniversary compilation. Hope you enjoy. <laughs>